Live from St. Anselm College in New Hampshire, here again are David Muir and Martha Raddatz. And we welcome you back to the Republican debate from New Hampshire tonight here on ABC. And we're going to turn now to what it means to be a conservative. And I want to turn to Governor Kasich. Governor, while campaigning here in New Hampshire, you were already asked by ABC about groans from some conservatives after your endorsements from the New York Times and the Boston Globe. You said, quote, what conservatives have to know is they have to say, look, isn't it nice to have a conservative like me liked? And maybe they ought to think about it. Because if I get elected president, the Republican Party and the definition of conservatism is going to change. How would you change conservatism? Well, well, first of all, look, uh, as the New York Times said, he's certainly not a moderate, but he can bring people together to solve problems. And the, the fact of the matter is I've cut taxes more than anybody in the country uh, this year. I have, uh, I have balanced budgets, the federal budget, the state of Ohio budget. We're running a $2 billion surplus. We're up 400,000 jobs. And in Washington, we were able to have significant job growth uh, whenever we balanced the budget of which I was the architect. But here's the beauty of it. It's not just balancing a budget. It's about jobs. You know, when I was a kid growing up in a neighborhood where if dad went home at night and said, I lost my job today, it just killed the family. It just, it, ter- it just was a devastating effect. So we have to have economic growth. But once we have economic growth, I believe we have to reach out to people who live in the shadows. I believe we need to help the mentally ill, the drug addicted, the working poor. We need to help the developmentally disabled to rise. And we need to help our friends in the minority community develop entrepreneurship. In other words, in America, conservatism should mean not only that some rise with conservative principles, but everybody has a chance to rise regardless of who they are so they can live their God-given purpose. That's what conservatism should be. Governor Casey, thank you. Mr. Trump, you've heard the argument from many of the candidates on this stage that you're not a true conservative. Tell the voters watching tonight why you are. Well, I think I am. And to me, I view the word conservative as a derivative of of the word conserve. Uh, We want to conserve our money. We want to conserve our wealth. We want to conserve. We want to be smart. We want to be smart where we go, where we spend, how we spend. We want to conserve our country. We want to save our country. And we have people that have no idea how to do that, and they're not doing it. And it's a very important word, and it's something I believe in very, very strongly. Mr. Trump, thank you. Senator Rubio, you have said yourself that you don't think Donald Trump is running as a conservative. Did he convince you? Well, I think conservatism is about three things, and Donald touched on one of them, but it's about three things. The first is conservatism is about limited government, especially at the federal level. The federal government is a limited government, limited by the Constitution, which delineates its powers. If it's not in the Constitution, it does not belong to the federal government. It belongs to states, local communities, and the private sector. It's about free enterprise, which is an economic model that allows everyone to rise without pulling anyone down. The reason why free enterprise is the greatest economic model in the history of the world is because it's the only economic model where you can make poor people richer without making rich people poor. And it's about a strong national defense. It's about believing, unlike Barack Obama, that the world is a safer and a better place when America is the strongest military and the strongest nation on this planet. That's conservatism. Senator Rubio, thank you. I want to turn this discussion to the economy now. And Mr. Trump, Governor Christie has said, I tell everybody who goes to a Donald Trump event, if you get to ask a question, just ask him how. Christie said, I don't care which of the things he talks about, just ask him how. You have said that you'd be the greatest jobs president God ever created. Tell Americans watching tonight how many jobs you would create in the first term and how. Well, before I go there, I will tell you, I will bring jobs back from China. I will bring jobs back from Japan. I will bring jobs back from Mexico, where New Hampshire, by the way, has been virtually wiped out. They've lost so many businesses going to Mexico because of horrible trade deals. And now we're about to sign another trade deal, TPP, which is going to be a disaster for this country because they don't talk about monetary manipulation. It is going to be a disaster. I'm going to bring jobs back, and I'll start bringing them back very fast. Under my tax plan, right now we're the highest taxed country in the world. Under my plan, we cut not only taxes for the middle class, but we cut taxes for corporations. We will bring back trillions of dollars. That's offshore. Right now they have two and a half trillion dollars. And in my opinion, it's much more than that. That's what the government says. All of that money is going to come back. And we're not going to lose Pfizer, which is now leaving, and other great companies, which is now leaving. And they're all leaving. We have many, many companies that are leaving this country. We're not going to lose them anymore because we're going to have a tax structure that is going to keep them in our country. 
Mr. Trump, thank you. There are a lot of governors on this stage tonight, and Governor Christie, Governor Kasich has said of you, quote, in Ohio, we have balanced a budget. They don't have one over in New Jersey. Our credit has been strengthened. Their credit has been downgraded. We've got more jobs. How important are those metrics in choosing the next president? And is his job on credit, is his record on jobs, I should say, actually stronger than yours? Well, he deserves credit for his record on jobs. And he's done a very good job as governor of Ohio. Never said that John hasn't. He's done a very good job. Um, but, but unfortunately, John's been so busy doing other stuff, he's using old statistics. That's okay. New Jersey had its best year of job growth in the last 15 years under five different governors this year in New Jersey. New Jersey has cut spending over $2.3 billion, and we have 10,000 fewer employees than we had when I walked in the door. John has a bigger government now and more employees than he had when he walked in the door. But all that doesn't matter. What really matters is this that executive experience really matters. You heard this on the stage tonight. We've heard it said on the stage that President Obama knows exactly what he's doing. I'd like to ask all the veterans listening out there tonight who are waiting in line for health care, who are literally dying because the Veterans Administration doesn't work, do you think Barack Obama knows what he's doing? I don't. And I'll tell you something. Anybody who evaluates him as knowing what he's doing and managing the government doesn't know how to manage a government themselves. And one last thing, David, which I think is really important. I listened to Senator Rubio's answer on his bill. He said his bill couldn't pass on the Gang of Eight. He acted as if he was somehow disembodied from the bill. It was his bill. He said this idea doesn't work. It was his idea. See, when you're a governor, you have to take responsibility for these things. You can't just act as if it happened out of nowhere. We have to take responsibility as executives. I take responsibility for my record in New Jersey. We've rebuilt the economy, and we rebuilt after the second worst natural disaster in American history. I'm proud of my record. And by the way, I like Kasich's record, too. He's David. a good governor. David. governor. David. Thank you, Governor, governor Kasich. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm not here. I, I like Chris. You I did mean, say your record much. was better than but, his. But, let, but let, me, let me just tell you. First of all, we have the lowest number of state employees in 30 years. Uh, secondly, uh, we have grown government at the rate of inflation. And I went from an $8 billion hole to a $2 billion surplus. And we've grown jobs by 400,000. That's one of the fastest growing states in the country. Our pensions are secure and our credit is rock solid. Now, I've learned that. What makes, what makes things work? What gets the economy going, not just in Ohio, but in Washington? And it's three things. Common sense regulations, which we have. Lower taxes, which we have. The lowest taxes, tax cuts in the country. And thirdly, a fiscal plan to balance the budget. When you go from $8 billion in the hole to $2 billion in the black, when you cut taxes by $5 billion and you grow over 400,000 jobs, that is a record that I can take to Washington using the same formula that I used in Washington when I was part of the effort to balance the budget, to give us a surplus, and to create jobs. Governor That's what Kasich, I did, and I'll you. do it again Governor in the first Kasich, 100 days. I do want to turn from, from jobs to taxes. Well, that was mentioned by Governor If you'd like to respond to the Governor, yeah. you can. I'm going to <laughs> come to you next with the question anyway. You okay, can respond good, to that question. In uh, here's the, going going from here, jobs right. to taxes, and here, here's well, the Well, no, sorry, number. let me respond to that question. To the Gang of Eight bill first. Well, here's the response. If, I think... Anyone who believes that Barack Obama isn't doing what he's doing on purpose doesn't understand what we're dealing with here. Okay? This is a president. This is a president who is trying to change this country. When he talked about change, he wasn't talking about dealing with our problems. Obamacare was not an accident. The undermining of the Second Amendment is not an accident. The gutting of our military is not an accident. The undermining of America on the global stage is not an accident. Barack Obama is indeed trying to redefine this country. We better understand what we're dealing with here, because that's what Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders want to double down on if they are elected. The governor wasn't talking about the president. He was talking about no, the gang of eight Barack Obama. But let me ask you about taxes, uh, yes. Senator Rubio. A recent poll, 68% of Americans favor raising taxes on people making more than a million a year. Are they wrong? I don't know of any problem in America that's going to be fixed with a tax increase. We have an economy today an economy today that is not creating jobs that pay enough. And one of the reasons why is because we have one of the most expensive business tax rates on the planet. Our combined business tax rate puts us among the highest in the industrialized world. And then on top of that, we are the only one that has a worldwide system of taxation, where an American company who makes money abroad has to pay taxes where they made the money, and then taxes a second time when they bring it back. The combination of these two things has stranded over $2 trillion, the equivalent of the size of the Russian economy, $2 trillion of American corporate money stranded overseas, combined with all of these inversions of companies leaving us. 
The solution to the problems we have today are not a tax increase. It is to lower our taxes on both people and on companies so that we can make America globally competitive again. Senator Rubio, thank you. I want to bring in Governor Bush. And, and Governor, I just want to repeat that number for you. 68% of Americans favor raising taxes on people making more than a million. What would you say to the people who believe that tonight? I'd like to see more millionaires. I think we need to grow more millionaires. We need to create a prosperity society where people can rise up. This notion that somehow we're undertaxed as a nation is just, just foolhardy when we have entitlements growing far faster than our ability to pay for it. A conservative, because that's the point of this, believes in limited government, believes in entrepreneurial capitalism and a strong national defense. But it also has to be, we need to reform things. In my town hall meetings, I went to a place where a woman described her neighbor who has a better economic deal by not working than her struggling to make ends meet. We be, need to be on the side of working people. And, pro, you know, the problem with the left is another tax, another regulation, another mandate makes it harder for them to rise up. Everything that we should do should be focused on high sustained economic growth where the middle class gets a raise for the first time and where people are rewarded for work rather than non-work. And I know how to do this. And if people are interested in the specifics of this, they ought to go to Jeb2016.com. Dude, that was coming. Governor. Hey, David. Thank you. David. Welcome. Hey, David. David. Hey, David. I, I actually have experience with raising taxes on millionaires in my state. It was done. It was done by my predecessor. And I want everybody in the public who is in at 68 percent, I want to tell you the truth. You're wrong. And here's why you're wrong. After New Jersey raised taxes on millionaires, we lost in the next four years $70 billion in wealth left our state. It left our state to go where it would be treated more kindly. If, if the United States raised taxes any further, that money will leave the United States as well. We won't have better jobs. Let New Jersey be the canary in the coal mine. It is a failed idea and a failed policy. It's class warfare. It happened in my state. I've stopped it from happening again. But we cannot do it. The 68% of the people are wrong about that. It will hurt the American economy. We tried it in New Jersey. Come take a look. It did not work. Governor Christie, thank you. Martha? Senator Cruz, you advocate what you call carpet bombing or saturation bombing to defeat ISIS, citing the more than 1,100 air attacks a day the U.S. carried out during the first Gulf War in 1991. Explain how a strategy to defeat a standing army would work against an unconventional terrorist group that is now hiding amongst the population. Well, sure, it starts with a commander-in-chief that sets the objective. And the objective has to be utterly and completely destroying ISIS. Obama hasn't started with that objective, and everything else flows from there. Once you set that objective, we have the tools to carry that out. The first tool is overwhelming air power. It is one of the blessings of the United States of America having the greatest military in the face of the earth, is we have the ability to use that air power. As you noted, the first Persian Gulf War, it was 1,100 air attacks a day. Obama is launching between 15 and 30. Now, when I say saturation carpet bombing, that's not indiscriminate. That is targeted at oil facilities. It's targeted at the oil tankers. It's targeted at command and control locations. It's targeted at infrastructure. It's targeted at communications. It's targeted at bombing all of the roads and bridges going in and out of Raqqa. It's using overwhelming air power. You know, a couple of weeks ago, it was reported that a facility is open called Jihadist University. Now, the question I wonder, why is that building still standing? It should be rubble. And if you had a president, although I will say this, I would be willing to wait until freshman orientation before launching those bombs. Senator Cruz, would you like to expand or loosen the rules of engagement? I was just over in a command center yes. in Erbil, and they said they thought the rules of engagement worked because you have so many civilians in those populated areas. They don't want to hit civilians. Martha, I will tell you, I have visited with active duty military, with veterans over and over and over again in town halls all over the state of New Hampshire. What we are doing to our sons and daughters, it is immoral. We are sending them in to fight with their arms tied behind their back. They cannot defend themselves, and it is wrong. And I will tell you this, look, America has always been reluctant to use military force. It's the last step we take. But if and when we use it, and when it comes to defeating ISIS, we should use it. 
we should use overwhelming force, kill the enemy, and then get the heck out. Don't engage in nation building, but instead allow our soldiers to do their jobs instead of risking their lives with politicians, making it impossible for them to accomplish the objective. So loosen the rules of engagement. Absolutely, yes. Senator Rubio, you said in the last debate that ISIS is the most dangerous jihadist group in the history of mankind and that it will take overwhelming U.S. force to defeat them. Can you specifically tell us what you mean by overwhelming force? Well, first, we need to understand who they are. ISIS is not just a jihadist group. They're an apocalyptic group. They want to trigger a showdown in a city named Dabiq between the West and themselves, which they believe will trigger the arrival of their messianic figure. And I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. The reason why it's important to understand that is because these are not groups that are just going to go away on their own. They are going to have to be defeated. And I believe they need to be defeated on the ground by a ground force made up primarily of Sunni Arabs. It will take Sunni Arabs to reject them ideologically and defeat them militarily. That will require a coalition of Iraqis and Syrians that are also Sunnis, but it will also require the cooperation of Jordanians, Egyptians. We should ask more of the Saudis. That will need to be backed up with more U.S. Special Operation Forces alongside them. And it will have to be backed up with increased airstrikes. And we're going to have to strike them, not just in Iraq and in Syria, but in every other part of the world where they've now created hubs of operation. They have affiliates in over a dozen countries across this planet. They have a sophisticated network of uh, radicalizing people here in the homeland and around the world. But it all begins by taking away their safe operating spaces with a ground force that a U.S.-led coalition takes on. You Again, Senator Rubio, you've already said ISIS is the most dangerous jihadist group in the history of mankind. So that would make it more dangerous than Al-Qaeda, the insurgents we fought in Iraq. We committed hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops to fight those groups. So if ISIS is the most dangerous group in history, why not commit a large U.S. ground force? Because they currently occupy Sunni cities and villages. Sunni cities and villages can only truly be liberated and held by Sunnis themselves. If they are held by Shia, it will trigger sectarian violence. The Kurds are incredible fighters, and they will liberate the Kurdish areas, but Kurds cannot and do not want to liberate and hold Sunni villages and towns. It will take Sunni fighters themselves in that region to take those villages and cities and then to hold them and avoid the sort of sectarian violence that follows in the past. And why that is important is because if Sunnis are not able to govern themselves in these areas, you are going to have a successor group to ISIS. Al ISIS is a successor group of Al-Qaeda. In fact, they broke away from Al-Qaeda because as horrible as Al-Qaeda is, ISIS thought Al-Qaeda was not radical enough. This is who we're dealing with, and they have more money than Al-Qaeda ever had. Well, Martha, what, would you Martha, do, what would you do differently to try to get those Sunni forces? They have not been coming forward. Well, the problem with the Sunni forces in the region is they don't trust this administration. This administration cut a deal with their mortal enemies, the Shia, in Iran. It poisoned the well with these countries. It makes it very difficult to cooperate with them as a result. They also, by the way, understand what real U.S. air power looks like. They saw the Iraq war. They saw up close to Opso Afghanistan. They know what air power looks like when the United States is committed to the cause. And they see the airstrikes that are being conducted now, and they say to themselves, that's not real commitment. We know what real commitment looks like. The Georgianian king was in Washington three weeks ago. He told everyone who would listen that they have begged for permission from the coalition to target caravans. And the coalition, meaning U.S. leadership on the ground, would not allow them to proceed with those airstrikes. Mr. Trump, thank you very much, Senator Rubio. Mr. Trump, you have said you will vigorously bomb ISIS. You've said we've got to get rid of ISIS quickly, quickly. How would you get rid of them so quickly? And please give us specifics. Well, four years ago, I said bomb the oil and take the oil. And if we did that, they wouldn't have the wealth they have right now. Now I still say the same thing, because we're doing little pinpricks. We're not even bombing. If somebody's driving a truck, they give notice to the person driving the truck, we're going to bomb. If they don't get out of the truck, the truck sails away with the oil. We actually have a case where we don't want to bomb the oil because we don't want to hurt, pollute the atmosphere. Can you imagine General Douglas MacArthur or General Patton saying we can't bomb because we're going to hurt the atmosphere? You have to knock the hell out of the oil. You have to take the oil. And you also have back channels of banking. You have people that you think are our great allies, our friends in the Middle East, that are paying tremendous numbers of dollars, tremendous amounts of money. 
to ISIS. So we have to stop those circuits. Nobody knows banking better than I do. They have back circuits, back channels. Tremendous amounts of money is coming in through the banking system. So between the oil and the banking, you will dry them up. But it should have been done four years ago, not now. And, and what would you do in those cities where there are people who we are trying to help, who ISIS is essentially help, holding hostage? You have to go in. First of all, when you take away their money, when you take away their wealth, that'll very much weaken, and it'll happen fairly fast. They'll last for about a year based on all of the wealth they've accumulated. But when you stop the banking channels and when you stop the oil and take the oil, not just bomb it, take it, when you do that, it's going to dry up very quickly. They're going to become a very weakened power, quickly. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Thank Mr. You. Trump. Let's turn to Libya. Governor Bush, it is a country in chaos. There is no government. This week, defense officials said there are now 5,000 ISIS fighters there, roughly doubling previous estimates. We know you and others have been critical of the administration's handling of Libya after the initial airstrikes that you supported. But this is a problem you would stand to inherit if you're the next president. Reports this week said the administration is considering new airstrikes, possible special operations raids. Would you support renewed airstrikes or any U.S. involvement on the ground? I would, and I would do it in concert again with our Arab allies and with Europe, most particularly in this case. This is the lesson learned in history. If you bomb something and not do anything as it relates to deal with the aftermath of this, if you don't have a stable government, you get what we have in Libya. Uh, and this is not leading from behind. It's not an effective policy. We have to lead. Without the United States, nothing seems to work. Europe doesn't have the ability to, to, to lead, forward lean in this regard. And so dealing with the caliphate it is important because it now has spawned other areas. There's been 70 plus attacks in 17 countries, either inspired by ISIS or organized by ISIS, Libya being the most important one now. We have to t deal with the caliphate with building a Sunni army there, but we also have to deal with it in Libya. And I think the United States ultimately is going to play, a, play a, a significant role in this. The problem with the Obama administration is that they see this incrementally. They're reluctant. They don't lead. No one knows whether we're serious. And when we do it, we do it in increments they can barely see. The United States has to lead in a much more aggressive way than we're doing right now. Thank you very much, Governor Bush. Dr. Carson. Yeah, I, I want to say something about this because I'm not here just to add beauty to the stage. Um, you know, I've been talking about Libya for quite a long time. I think I was the first one to start talking about it because I say we have to have a pro active foreign policy strategy. And of course, the next place that ISIS is going to attack to is Libya. If you want to expand your caliphate and increase your influence, then you're going to go to a place that's strategically located. You go north across the Mediterranean, you're into southern Europe. You go south, you're into Chad and Sudan and Niger. And not to mention the fact that you've had much more oil than you do in Iraq. That's the kind of place that they're going to go to. Therefore, we need to be thinking about how do we prevent them from tacking over there. They're already sending their fighters there. We need to be consulting with our military experts and asking them what do they need in order to prevent ISIS from being able to take over Libya. That's going to have Martha. enormous consequences. And would you for support renewed airstrikes? Uh, I would support the possibility of renewed airstrikes if in conjunction with our joint chiefs and our military people, they felt that that was an appropriate strategy. The fact of the matter is, none of us up here is a military expert. And uh, we sometimes act like we are, but we're not. And if we actually sit down and talk with them and get them to understand our plan and get their impression of what needs to be done, I think we're going to make a lot more progress. Martha and David, I just... We're going to move Martha on. And David. Martha, thank you. We're just going to, we're going to stay on ISIS here and the war on terror because, as you know, there's been a debate in this country about how to deal with the enemy and about enhanced interrogation techniques ever since 9-11. So, Senator Cruz, you have said, quote, torture is wrong, unambiguously, period. Civilized nations do not engage in torture. Some of the other candidates say they don't think waterboarding is torture. Mr. Trump has said, I would bring it back. Senator Cruz, is waterboarding torture? Well, under the definition of torture, no, it's not. Under, under the law, torture is excruciating pain that is equivalent to losing, losing organs and systems. So under the definition of torture, it is not. It is enhanced interrogation. It is vigorous interrogation, but it does not meet the 
generally recognized definition of torture. If elected president, would you bring it back? Uh, I would not bring it back in any sort of widespread use. And, and indeed, I joined with Senator McCain in legislation that, that would prohibit line officers from employing it because I think bad things happen when enhanced interrogation is employed at lower levels. But when it comes to keeping this country safe, the Commander-in-Chief has inherent constitutional authority to keep this country safe. And so if it were necessary to, say, prevent a city from facing an imminent terrorist attack, you can rest assured that as Commander-in-Chief, I would use whatever enhanced interrogation methods we could to keep this country safe. Senator Cruz, thank you. Mr. Trump, you said not only does it work, but that you'd bring it back. Well, I'll tell you what. In the Middle East, we have people chopping the heads off Christians. We have people chopping the heads off many other people. We have things that we have never seen before as a group. We have never seen before what's happening right now. The medieval times, I mean, we studied medieval times. Not since medieval times have people seen what's going on. I would bring back waterboarding, and I'd bring back a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding. Mr. Trump, thank you. Okay, Governor I Bush, you have said that you won't rule waterboarding out. Congress has passed laws banning the use of waterboarding by the military and the CIA, as you know. Would you want Congress to change that if you're elected no, president? No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. And um, it was used sparingly. Uh, Congress has changed the laws, and I, and I think where we stand is the appropriate place. But what we need to do is to make sure that we expand our intelligence capabilities. The idea that we're going to solve this fight with predator the drones, killing people somehow is, a, is more acceptable than capturing them, securing the information. This is why closing Guantanamo is a complete disaster. What we need to do is make sure that we are kept safe by having intelligence capabilities, both human and technological intelligence capabilities, far superior than what we have today. That's how you get a more safe place, is by making sure that we're fully engaged. And right now, this administration doesn't do that. Governor Bush, thank you. Senator Rubio, I do want to ask you, you have said that you do not want to telegraph to the enemy what you would do as commander-in-chief. But for the American people watching tonight who want to know where the next president will stand, do you believe waterboarding is torture? Well, when people talk about interrogating terrorists, they're acting like this is some sort of law enforcement function. Law enforcement is about gathering evidence to take someone to trial and convict them. Anti-terrorism is about finding out information to prevent a future attack. So the same tactics do not apply. And it is true, we should not be discussing white, in a widespread way the exact tactics that we're going to use because it allows terrorists and others to practice how to evade us. But here's the bigger part problem with all this. We're not interrogating anybody right now. Guantanamo is being emptied by this president. We should be putting people into Guantanamo, not emptying it out, and we shouldn't be releasing these killers who are rejoining the battlefield against the United States. Senator Rubio, thank you. We want to turn now to the topic of executive orders, and for that we're going to turn back to Mary Catherine Hamm. Mary Catherine. Thanks, David. Uh, Senator Cruz, on the campaign trail, you've promised voters a lot and fast. If you're elected president, you say you'd end Common Core immediately, abolish the IRS, and do away with sanctuary cities. You've also been a persistent critic of President Obama's executive overreach, going it alone, not working with Congress. How do you intend to implement this aggressive ag agenda within your constitutional authority, especially given that it would require working with Congress and Washington players with whom you're happy to say you have a strained relationship? Well, thank you for that question. You know, there are three avenues of presidential authority to change the direction of this country. The first is executive power. The second is for foreign policy. And the third is legislation. Executive power, as we all know, has been the preferred vehicle of President Obama abusing his authority, abusing his constitutional authority. Now, the silver lining of that is everything done with executive power can be undone with executive power. So I have pledged on day one... I will rescind every single illegal and unconstitutional executive action Barack Obama has done. That means on day one, his efforts to restrict the Second Amendment go away with a strike of a pen. That means on day one, his illegal executive amnesty goes away with a strike of a pen. The reason I can end Common Core at the federal level is because Obama is abusing executive power using race to the top funds in the Department of Education to force it on the states. That's one avenue. The second av avenue of change is foreign policy. And foreign policy can change the fastest. It's worth remembering 
that Iran released our hostages the day Reagan was sworn in. And then the third is legislation, and that can only be done with the people behind you, which is why the two big legislative initiatives I'm campaigning on are repealing Obamacare and adopting a simple flat tax to abolish the IRS. Mr. Trump, if Senator Cruz is known for opposing deals, you literally wrote the book on making them. Senator Cruz has mentioned that on the trail. What would you say to those conservatives who are concerned that a dealmaker will just perpetuate the same deals in Washington and the way that things run now? How do you disturb no, the status quo? No, a point? good dealmaker will make great deals, but will do it the way our founders thought it should be done. People get together, they make deals. Ronald Reagan did it with Tip O'Neill very successfully. You didn't hear so much about executive orders, if you heard about it at all. You have to be able to get a consensus. Now, the real person, like it was mentioned about the deal with Iran, how bad a deal is that? It doesn't get any more amateurish than that. A good dealmaker would never make a deal like that. With Congress, you have to get everybody in a room, and you have to get them to agree. But you have to get them to agree what you want. And that's part of being a dealmaker. You can't leave the White House, go to Hawaii and play golf for three weeks and be a real dealmaker. It doesn't work that way. You have to get people in, grab them, hug them, kiss them, and get the deal done. But it's got to be the deal that you want. Governor Kasich. Yeah. Is the problem with Washington that there are too many deals or too few? Well, right now, the deals are, there's no leadership. I mean, a lot of the things that we're talking about here tonight, you know, on the border and uh, so many of the things, you know, what we should be doing on foreign policy. You know what the problem is, uh, Mary Catherine, is there's not a leader that gets somebody to rise up. You have to have a leader that can inspire. I mean, actually, some of what Donald was saying is true. Look, do you know how hard it was to get the, federally the federal budget balanced? You have to plead with people. To do what we've done in Ohio, you have to plead with people. Then you go back down to Washington and do the same thing. You see, we have to remind people we're Americans before we're Republicans and Democrats. And when we wait and when we delay, what we end up doing, Mary Catherine, is we make the United States weaker. In fact, it's a foreign policy issue because people look at America not solving problems and they say, what, what, what are they doing over there? So the point is you have to work with people. The problem with executive authority for the president it's really bad news for this reason. Since he's given up on working with Congress, he thinks he can impose anything he wants. He's not a king. He's a president. An executive order should be used, frankly, in consolidation and with co consulting with the leadership in the, in the Congress. I've done it in Ohio. I consult. I can use executive orders, but I don't trump the legislature because if you do, you aggravate them, you anger them, and then the long-term prospects get bleak. We have to solve problems in America by coming together, Republicans and Democrats, Americans first, party and ideology second, in the second back seat of this country. That's what we need to do. And we can do it. And we can do it. This is a... This is an important subject. I agree with everything that's been said here about repealing unconstitutional rules and rules that are creating real burdens for investing that creates jobs. But we also ought to get back to being a Tenth Amendment country, uh, country as well, a country that respects the states to be able to make more decisions. And in the Bush administration, we would shift t transportation dollars back to the states. I trust Kasich and Christie to build the roads and the infrastructure of their states than Washington, D.C. EPA delegated authority back to the states. Education dollars back to the states. I would like to see reform take place all across the country where there's more vouchers, more freedom. If we did that, we would shrink government's power in Washington, D.C., and we would have a much more effective government where people would begin to trust our government again because now no one believes it works. Let me, Mary Catherine, I would, I would just say this to you. You must have an agenda that you are ready to move on in the first hundred days. Jeb is right. If you delay and you wait, uh, the, the Washington operators will, will take you down. 
I can tell you this, in the first 100 days, I will have legislation to freeze federal regulations, have them reviewed by the vice president, reduce state taxes on individuals, reduce taxes on corporations, have a fiscal plan to balance the budget, get the border protected, and begin to fix Social Security in the first 100 days. So anybody who's here tonight, if I get elected president, head out tomorrow and buy a seatbelt, because there's going to be so much happening in the first 100 days, it's going to make your head spin, and we're going to move America forward. I promise you, we're going to move us forward. He mentioned me. <laughs> he mentioned me. He mentioned me. One other thing that I think we ought to do, well, along with repealing Obamacare, we need to shift all this power of health care, which is the most egregious form of federal power that is suppressing wages and income, and allow governors to have the Medicaid plans so that they can create 21st century Medicaid insurance for, for people that are stuck in poverty. There's so much that could be done, but I don't trust Washington to do it. I trust the state capitals to be the place to be the source of innovation and reform in this country. Thank you, Gov Adios. Thank you Governor. <laughs> David, back to you. Mary Catherine, thank you. We want to turn to something the governor of New Hampshire said. <laughs> but Jeb mentioned me. It's time for me to go again. I didn't mention him the second time. <laughs> he says he didn't mention me the second time. I thought I heard it, Jeb. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you all very much for listening and being patient with all of us tonight. Thank you. A connection here on the stage. We're, we're going to move on to the, what the governor of New Hampshire said just this week, and, and that is that heroin overdose is now the second leading cause of death in this state. You don't need me to tell you that. But there's another number. 48% of the people here in this state know someone who has abused heroin. Josh, who covers this for WMUR, has the next question. Uh, you're all aware, candidates, that this is a major problem here in New Hampshire. It's a very deadly problem as well. Last month, New Hampshire Senators Kelly Ayotte, Republican, and Gene Shaheen, Democrat, they went down to Washington along with the police chief of the state's largest city to testify before the Judiciary Committee in D.C. Senator Cruz, you're a member of that committee. Your campaign schedule didn't allow you to attend this. Even so, the police chief called your absence outrageous, given the severity of the problem. Last week, though, you told a personal story of a close family member struggle with addiction. What can you say to law enforcement right now to convince them that you understand the severity of this problem and you're not just saying what people want to hear days before the primary? Well, Josh, as you noted, this is a problem that, for me, I understand firsthand. Uh, my older sister, Miriam, who was my half-sister, uh, struggled her whole life with drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, my father and her mom divorced when she was a little girl, and she was angry her whole life. And she ended up marrying a man who'd been in and out of jail. She then became a single mom, and she herself went to jail several times, and she ended up spending some time in a crack house. I, I still remember my father and me driving up to get Miriam out of that crack house to try to convince her she needed to be a mom to, to my nephew, Joey. Um, she wasn't willing to listen. She was not willing to change the path she was on. She was angry. Um, I was, had just gotten my first job uh, coming out of law school. I took a $20,000 loan on a credit card to put my nephew Joey in, in Valley Forge Military Academy. He was in sixth grade at the time to pay his way through that. And about five, six years ago, Miriam died of an overdose. It was the coroner ruled it accidental. We don't know. She went to sleep one night, had taken too many pills, and, and Joey walked in and found her dead. This is an absolute epidemic. We need leadership to solve it. Solving it has to occur at the state and local level with programs like AA and counseling and churches and charities, but it also has to occur securing the borders because you've got Mexican cartels that are smuggling vast amounts of heroin into this country. We know how to secure the borders. What is missing is the political will to do it. And as president, I will secure the border. We will end this deluge of drugs that is flowing over our southern border and that is killing Americans across this country. Uh, Governor Christie, you've talked a lot about this issue here in New Hampshire, uh, state reforms, criminal justice reforms, access to treatment. Uh, to Senator Cruz's point, let's take it a step further. Would you be willing to engage in cross-border enforcement into Mexico, the place where law enforcement here in New Hampshire has traced a lot of this supply back to, 
Would you engage in cross-border enforcement without the cooperation of the Mexican government? Of course I would. As a former United States attorney who spent seven years of my life fighting this on the streets of my state, I would do that. But we need to do more. And let me tell you what we've done in New Jersey, Josh. We're working with the folks in New Hampshire and their legislature right now to show them how we're helping to solve this problem in New Jersey. Not just for this campaign. Three years ago, we pro I proposed a law that we signed into, into effect, which said that anyone who is a nonviolent, non-dealing, first-time drug offender no longer goes to prison in New Jersey. They go to mandatory inpatient drug treatment. What's happened is crime has gone down 20 percent in those three years. The prison population has gone down 10 percent. We've now closed the state prison, closed the state prison, and we're turning into a drug rehabilitation facility so people can get the tools they need. Listen, everyone out there knows this in New Hampshire. This is a disease. It's not a moral failing. It's a disease, and we need to give people the treatment they need. And let me tell you why. Because I'm pro-life. And I'm pro-life not just for the nine months in the womb. I'm pro-life for when they get out, and it's a lot more complicated. 16-year-old heroin-addicted drug girl on the floor of the county lockup. I'm pro-life for her life. The 42-year-old lawyer who's taking Oxycontin and can't get out of bed and support his family. I'm pro-life for his life. Every one of those lives is an individual gift from God. And the last thing is this. These efforts we've taken over the last three years, 2015 in New Jersey, for the first time in four years, drug overdose deaths have gone down, not up. I'll bring the same solutions to the country. Governor Christie, we from the floor. Thanks very much. Dave, Martha, back to you. Thank you, Governor Christie. Thank you, Josh. Our partner in this debate, the Independent Journal Review, has collected questions from some prominent conservatives around the country. Here's a videotaped question from radio host Larry O'Connor. In 2008, we saw how motivated an electorate can be when they think their vote is making history. Let's face it, if Hillary Clinton is the nominee for the Democrats, you'll be running against the prospect of the first woman president. How will you change that narrative and motivate the electorate behind your candidacy? Well, Mr. Trump, one, I'm going to give that question to you. You, yes. took it, you took it away anyway. Oh, okay, good. It looked like he was looking right at me right there. Uh, I think that I look at what's going on. I look at all of the polls. I do very, very well against Hillary Clinton. I can tell you I'm the last person that she wants to run against. And I think you can see what we've done in terms of galvanizing. I've, I've been all over the country. We're, uh, last night, I was in South Carolina. We had 12,000 people. It's set up in about four days. We have galvanized, and we've created a movement. A lot of it has to do with, as an example, Josh's question on drugs. I'm the first one that said, build a wall. But I mean a real wall, not a toy wall like they have right now. A real wall. And you'll solve lots of problems. But we will galvanize the people of this country, and we will beat Hillary Clinton. Because assuming that she runs, by the way, how she gets away with the email stuff is hard to believe. So I don't know that she's going to be running. But on the assumption she runs, I mean, look... And speaking of that, if she runs, she's running for one reason. She's going to be able to run for one reason, and that's because the Democrats are protecting her. Because so many people have done so much less than her, and they were absolutely, their lives have been destroyed. But on the assumption they do protect her, I will win the election, and we will win it by a lot. We will win it handily. We cannot have another four years of essentially Barack Obama. Martha? Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Trump. I'm going to go to Senator Rubio on this. How would you change that narrative? I think it's already happening. Look at the turnout in Iowa. A historic number of people came out and voted in those caucuses. They're saying the same thing's going to happen here in New Hampshire. Look at the rallies that every single person on the stage is having. Much higher numbers than you used to see in the past. And here's why. Because people are starting to understand very clearly that this election is going to be a turning point. That 2016 is not just a choice between Republican or Democrat. It is a referendum on our identity as a nation and as a people. And so here's what Hillary Clinton needs to understand. We're going to have our primary. We're going to have our debates, which, by the way, are twice as many as the Democrats have been willing to have themselves. But we're going to bring this party together. And we are going to defeat Hillary Clinton because she is unqualified to be the president of the United States of America. She put classified information on her computer because she thinks she's above the law. And anyone who lies to the families of people who have lost their loved ones in the service of our country, like she did in Benghazi, can never be the commander in chief of the United States of America. Thank you, Senator Rubio. Martha. Dr. Carson, I want to go to you on Larry O'Connor's question. Would you change the narrative? Would we, it's the same question? Yes. Yes. Well, first of all, I think it would be a pretty easy contrast, uh, quite frankly, between myself and Hillary Clinton. Uh, in one case, you have someone who 
is known as a deceitful individual, uh, an individual who, at Benghazi, which I will never let go, quite frankly, because I think of those uh, two men who went up there on the top of that compound with machine guns, firing away, uh, allowing their colleagues to escape. And I'm sure in the back of their mind, they were just saying, if we can just hold on, help is on the way. But help was not on the way. When did we in the United States not send people to help our own people? You know, this is not who we are. And I would simply make it a referendum on honesty and integrity versus deceit and the Washington way. Martha. Thank you very much, Dr. Martha. Carson. I'm going to go back Martha. to David. Governor, we'll come to you in the next segment. When we come back, questions about race, about our veterans and social issues, what younger conservative voters are now saying as we continue from New Hampshire with the Republican debate right here on ABC.